How early before, I mean, do we test it the weekend before, anything like that to kind of? We don't. We don't have a process for that. Um, it's, uh, I know it would make sense if we had uh, staff to go through all of our buildings and make sure everything was running. Uh, but some of the stuff doesn't run until we're on demand, so to force things to be able to run when we don't have the temperatures doesn't really give us a good representation as to what it can and can't do. Can you explain, like, the on-demand? So if you're at, so I'm going to use Broughton. Sure, Broughton go ahead. They track problems. So they can't staff at the school, the principal or whomever can't turn on, they get to a Friday, everyone's going, they can't have the AC run on Saturday just to check it. Kind of um, I'm sure they could request that, um, but when it comes to outdoor temperatures, if it's below, say, 55 or it's around 55 right. degrees, the system won't necessarily kick into a cooling mode, Got even it. if we tell it to be on. We would have to go through and uh, manually force things to run. Okay. Um, and uh, at Broughton, for instance, this past week we had a chiller failure, uh, which we addressed. We had a building automation thing, which just didn't come on, which was an easy fix, but it was inconvenient and it didn't have the system running when it should be running. Um, and then I think we found another piece of equipment which still needs repair. So, um, you know, yes, it's a great idea, and I'd love to be able to do that. Um, but for 200 facilities, it's it's a it's a pretty daunting task to go and pre-run everything and try and make. Hypothetically, up. what would you need? Is what it would just I need? Staffing? Um, off the cuff, I couldn't tell you. Okay. Yeah. I, we, I don't. Can you bring that to us? Like, hey, just hypothetically, what we would need to test, especially if we have ones, maybe even just testing the ones that have had failures in the past where it might limit the number? Yeah, I, um, you know, we have a list of, especially the ones that we just recently had failures, we try and yeah. make sure that those work. Um, we have ones that, uh, we have so many lists. Sure. We I have know. ones that, that are, are, you know, old and have to run a certain way and need a certain amount of TLC. Yeah. We have ones that uh, had recent repairs. We've had ones that um, repairs are in progress and we have to run them um, you know, extra hours to make sure that they're operational every day. Um, so it's kind of, it's tough to tend to all the lists. I got guys, uh, a couple of people who have managed to keep it square and... Um, what, and this may not be a question for you, but um, somebody else, when we have an, an outage at a school, how much detail do we give around, you know, hey, it was, do we just say the air, the AC was out, or do we actually kind of tell the story of what actually happened? Do you have any sense to, of that? To parents? Yes. The, um, the information that I've seen that's gone out to parents is typically fairly generic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll say we had a problem with the AC or we had a power outage or something fairly high level just to let them know that, that there was <coughs> something that happened at the school that day, um, usually getting technical doesn't necessarily yeah. provide more information. Okay. Any other questions for operations? I would just like to second yes. the kind of wish list, yeah. just so we have an idea of what we can help you with if we knew what would make it run smoother. We mm -hmm. obviously, I know you guys don't want either to wind up where we were last year. So if we can know what your priorities are with the wish list, I think that would help us move forward too. Sure. And I mean, I, I just I want to stress the point that we can we can probably always do more, but the fact of the matter is um, some of this stuff is going to break down, despite best efforts. So you know we're going to have failures, um, we're going to have things that we can't get parts for immediately, um, and, and as a maintenance department, we're going to be we're going to do everything we can to avoid that, but it, it still happens. Brand new schools, very old schools, um, it, it doesn't seem to matter. As, uh, as my predecessor like like to say, he said, uh, Murphy's our cousin, <coughs> Murphy's law. Yeah. Just so. going to say that. <laughs> Murphy's yeah. law has a funny way. Absolutely. Since it's um, budget season, are we thinking about how we're paying to try to fill some of these urgent? Um, I use the, I'm using the term urgent, but these maintenance positions that might, as far as restructuring salaries or condensing to spread money around. We, we've been in some initial conversations with, with finance and with uh, HR. Okay. So, good start. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm sure everybody 
diligently looked over the March minutes, and so do I hear a motion to approve the minutes from March. As I did indeed diligently look over I the minutes. I knew you would. Yes. I move that we approve the minutes from March 2024. Second. From Second. anybody? From the seconds. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And now we will move to our, I love the title, the flexible capacity presentation. It is all yours. So staff is here today to provide a brief history of why we're using flexible capacity and why it's been necessary. <coughs> uh, we're here to provide an update of the current inventory of trailers, to provide an update of the maintenance costs associated with trailers, the options and costs associated with using other forms of flexible capacity, an update of the recent progress or planned work for removing trailers, and a long-range view for trailers as part of our flexible capacity plan. I'm joined today by members from Facilities Design and Construction and from members of the School Choice Planning and Assignment Team who have provided input as part of this presentation. Um, we're also providing this in response to the board members' request for this particular information, specifically around trailers. Okay. To just give you a brief history of trailers, we've needed trailers to deal with the high growth that our district has dealt with over the last several decades. Um, one really good fact to, to share with you is since 1991-92, Wake County has grown by over 94,000 students. So to put that in perspective, that growth alone would make it the third largest school district in the state. Okay. So again, as we continue to share with you, we as a school system do not have control over the growth that comes in our particular area, so we must be reactive to that. And so we'll continue to do that. And trailers have been a huge part of dealing with that growth. Um, we've also needed the trailers long-term for the state implemented legislation in 2017 with K-3 class size legislation. Our school system lost over 9,000 seats of capacity during this decision. So significant issues <coughs> surrounding why this district has needed to use trailers over time, okay? So our current inventory, we have over 600 trailers that are providing approximately 19,000 additional seats of capacity for the school system, which registers to about 11% of our total capacity. The majority of the trailers that we have are owned by Wake County, with about 12% of them being leased units. And here I give you a breakdown of where these uh, mobile units are. 63% of them are at elementary, 17 at middle, 14 at high, and six other. The other would be like our swing space capacities uh, campuses, such as like a Spring Forest or a Garner Ninth Grade Center. Question for you. When you say leased <coughs> units, are they leased? How long are those leases in general? Are you getting for that later? How long do we have the leased units for? Um, so the average age is... Uh, I mean, like, if you sign a lease, are you signing a lease for a trailer for 10 years? Uh, or is it we do a three-year lease. And okay, it's renewed, right. renewed annually. But the price stays fixed for the three-year period. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. And we can negotiate a new price after the three-year window. Okay. okay. So the next three slides, I think, are pretty telling. And I want to spend a little bit of time giving you an opportunity to just see the difference. The map on the left shows you our current or our projected crowding for 2024-25. This picture includes trailer capacities. So this is the same map that was shared with you previously uh, when we showed our projections. The map on the right shows the change if we were to remove trailers, so we no longer had trailer capacity, that's what the crowding would look like. 
So the darker the color, the more <coughs> overcrowded the particular school is. And you can see our elementary schools significantly rely on trailer capacity in order to operate our business. For the middle schools. Mm -hmm. And then our high schools. So as you can tell from these three slides, not much white on the, the current map, the white meaning below 90% utilized. Right. Our, our sweet spot is about 90 to 95 percent, and so generally you're looking at you know schools in the orange, which are over, I believe it's 115 percent crowded. You've got significantly crowded schools when we don't utilize trailers. So cost and maintenance. Okay, so you asked for information about what does it take to maintain trailers in our school. And so here's some information about the average data for the last five years. Modular construction represents about 4% of the total building square footage. On average, over the last five years, our flexible capacity work orders comprised about 4% of the total building work orders. All right. On average, over the last five years, we've spent about 780,000 on flexible capacity classrooms. However, during the last year, we spent 1.25 million that was due to increases in funding availability and associated changes with approach to repairs, replacing systems, and services based on condition instead of repairing. Again, this also, that change also represents about 4% of our cost. Maintenance provides similar service to all structures in the district, whether it's brick and mortar or temporary construction. They're basically giving it the same um, attitude towards repair, repairing and replacing. Um, whether its service is um, temporary or temporarily un underutilized or if it's being used, they're, they're still maintaining them the same way. Um, financial commitment to buildings, regardless of the type of construction, is most likely due to the utilization of the same priorities when assessing repairs. When systems, services, or equipment fails, it is repaired or replaced. There's currently no scheduled repair or replacement based on age. Should there be a desire to proactively improve or renovate existing structures due to the strategic, uh, their strategic importance, importance, it may require capital improvement projects, which we'll talk about yeah. in the next couple slides about funding being a, a concern. What, I, I do have a question. What is a typical mobile work order? Like, what are we getting into there? So, um, Mobile work orders aren't unlike regular brick and mortar. The HVAC doesn't work. Um, roof leaks, um, you know, issues with flooring, <laughs> carpeting, that sort of thing. Um, mobiles also have different types of work orders, such as uh, we have to do underskirting and underpinning. We have to um, ramps, ramp repair is a big deal. Um, and part of uh, what Glenn talked about with um, we've started replacing whole ramp structures since we've gotten some more funding rather than just repairing the treads that are usually worn. Yeah. Um, so they have some unique things, um, but for the most part, work orders are work orders. So it's, it's no heat, it's you know something like that. Okay. I have a, a follow-up questions later. Okay. okay. Yeah, appreciate it. So what <laughs> options do we have? Okay, what <coughs> options do we use with flexible capacity? So the the least cost or the least cost effective way would be a partial renovation. The most cost effective way would be refresh or renovate existing trailers. And you can see the cost associated with each. These are all cost based on moving six classrooms. Okay. Refresh and renovate existing trailers costing about a million dollars. This would be going into an existing a trailer, tearing down the walls, redoing the walls. Uh, all the structure, but leaving that particular trailer on the campus. Adding or removing a trailer, again, that would be going onto a site, pulling it off, fixing the site to put it back to the, um, the style or location it was prior to the trailer being there, 
um, or adding a trailer to the campus to provide extra capacity. Adding flexible capacity is part of a major renovation or new construction. So this would be a project where we know we have a new school or a major renovation going on in the school and so trying to find ways to take the trail existing trailers off the campus and build that capacity into the building. And then flexible capacity is part of a partial renovation. This would be we don't have a planned renovation at the major renovation at the school so this would be kind of like a house adding an addition to a, a school. You're just going on and you're adding an additional structure that takes away the cap capacity uh, that you had in trailers but adds it into the building. Okay. So what are some of the considerations for each? Right? So if we go on and we're just trying to refresh or renovate the existing trailers, there's disruption to the programming while you're working on campus. Okay, because the students are generally in the trailers. Where do they go to classes while you're on the campus refreshing or renovating them? If it's a year-round school, you know, they're there all year, so you'd need to have some swing space for the students because they're going to have to have that extra classroom space. Um, it's competition with the capital improvement plan executive summary. It's that funding source. Where does that money come from? So if you're choosing to move trailers off of the campus, that money comes from a certain line item. But if you're looking to use it as part of a capital, um, a capital improvement plan, such as a, a renovation, a partial renovation, or a major renovation, those dollars are in competition with other projects. And you've seen primp and snap projects come across your your desk, um, you've seen the capital improvement plan, the executive summary, where it uh, balances renovations versus new schools, all of those come from the same dollars. And then funding, funding's always gonna be an issue and you'll see that common theme through each of these. Is if you're looking to remove trailers completely from the district, there's gonna be a significant funding source, not to mention other issues or concerns that would arise that we'll talk about. So considerations for adding and removing trailers. We added a visual here that just shows the escalating costs of moving trailers from our campuses, either adding them or removing them. Back in 2014, it was roughly, I think it's four, just under $400,000, and now you're over 1.8 million for six classrooms. And so in a 10 year period, you, your, your costs have escalated. Um, what are some of the issues and concerns with that? The increased cost over time, like I just shared. Lack of bids on projects. Um, we used to have multiple bidders on projects. You're seeing those numbers dwindle. Restrictions for transport. When you're moving a six or eight classroom unit, there are restrictions with regards to when you can move it and, and who needs to move it, what licenses they need to have. Um, we need the capacity. Um, when you looked at the maps, elementary and middle school specifically need that extra uh, temporary capacity, so just being able to take it away is not something we can afford to do at this time. Um, the ability to replace the capacity within the building. Some sites have restrictions of whether or not you can bring that mobile capacity into the building. Um, thinking of some of our downtown schools where we have <coughs> our, the ability where we um, can grandfather the capacity that we have on the campus, but if we were looking to do renovations, we would be held to different standards. And again, funding. What would be some of the restrictions? We have several, um, all types of schools, 200 schools, right? So there's going to be a lot of different scenarios. Um, what would be the restrictions that we would have on the property that would stop us from using the trailers versus the add-ons? So part of it would be the impervious surface requirements. Yeah, you yeah. don't have traffic concern. You've got to build in the traffic. You've got to build in. The storm water, they're always telling me storm water. Right? She gets me with the biggest surface all the time. We have added parking. So that's what he was talking about. Some of your downtown schools, you don't have the site, Douglas. You don't have the site to get all the traffic on the campus. So you can't build that capacity. It remains at what we built it at, what, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, so I think that's the struggle that we have is we have the capacity that's sitting on the campus right now. But if we build it into the school, then we're going to have to go, and when we're going through site plan approvals, we're going to have to bring right. that capacity up. So those are some of our challenges in our inside the belt line or just right outside what we call the realm schools. Just don't have the site. So if we have the students are on the site, but they're in a trailer, you're saying it's different if we move their seat inside the building? Yes, because 
back in the day, when we put trailers on our school sites, we could take what we call a PA drawing down to our planning department. And they looked at it as temporary capacity. They look at it as temporary buildings. So we could take that PA drawing with a little, with a little box on there and say, this is where we're putting it, and this is what we're gonna do. Now what they do is they look at it as, this is permanent capacity, no matter if you call it temporary, it's still permanent, and they put all the same requirements that they put on us as we're building a brand new school. So things have changed since we started, what'd you say, in 1991 on that. how we are putting mobiles on our school sites. So what are some of the things that we would need to, I guess, you're, you're saying basically up to code, right? right? So that's where you got your stacking requirements have changed. You can speak way more to stacking. Your carpool requirements have changed. Um, I think you comment. Stormwater has changed. You comment your driveways to a certain capacity in the school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though the capacity is, let's say, 600 and wouldn't actually go up, the requirements would go up? Correct. If you put more than 600, then your stacking goes No, but I'm saying, uh, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but we kind of talking about, we'll use Douglas as you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> if you did in addition to Douglas and you just took away the trailers and the capacity didn't change, would all those requirements still be? Yes. That's what I'm getting clear. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would have to have the ability or the money to add all of those new requirements or both. You don't have the space either. It, it all sure. will depend. I mean, yeah, space is going to be the first thing. We're just going to see if we can physically do it. Um, and then money, of yeah. course. Okay. So, I mean, space is going to be the first thing we look at. Can we physically get that many kids on this campus with all of the municipal requirements? So that's going to be our first step. It's just like, so long as we keep the campus the way it is, everything like with the new code updates and everything is frozen. But if we make a major renovation, a partial renovation, all of a sudden now we have to bring everything up to code. So you might lose all of this space you had on campus to do the queuing or the stacking, right? You might have to change because we have new requirements for stormwater and pervious surface things. You've got to put these impoundment areas and stormwater mitigation things on the property. So. It's like you have less land on the site when you renovated it because all these add-ons that you have to do to bring it up to code. I'm just sense. thinking with all of the <clears throat> building and construction, it's not just in our mm -hmm. rural and suburban areas, it's also in the city mm -hmm. where you just see these apartment buildings so our elevation is just changing even in Raleigh. Yeah. Um, and they're gonna keep adding you know, more and more housing even if they start to go up. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, does that mean our schools need to now do that? Well, then you start fire code. So you can't go but so high with right. elementary schools because your kindergarten, first grade have to stay on ground level. Your second grade can go to second level, but it can't go to third level. So that's where we have our challenges with, with building up. Then also the municipalities, I keep turning to her because she's our site planner. Also the municipalities have requirements, height requirements. Is that not correct? That's true, yep, the height mm -hmm. restrictions. But um, if my suspicion is if the apartment building has been rezoned, you know, that's how they you could rezone right. a property to go higher, but then you are limited to the students you can put up there. Right. Yeah. So so what I would say is ultimately if uh, the decision was to made to do something at a site. I mean, we're literally talking about 100 to 120 different plans because every site is going to be different yes. based on the size, the capacity, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so I think that's part of the issue that certainly there's nothing to say that you can't do it, but if you do it, it can literally be 100 different plans and they're all completely Correct. different. Yeah. 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 And we can't guarantee we'll get the same capacity and to even develop, um, excuse me, to even develop those plans is not free, right? Each individual plan, what, what is all that? Oh yeah, you're going to have to do feasibilities to see if it works, it fits. You're looking anywhere between fifty thousand to a hundred thousand for them to do a full assessment of the site to see what works. Yeah. But now I know you mentioned in some of the slides the amount that we spend. I think it's seven hundred ninety-two thousand a year in annual maintenance on some of these. I mean, it's a matter of 
you know, you're putting money in one place, but it's not really solving the problem, it's more a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. where if we permanently fix it in another spot, yes, it may cost us more money, but in the long run, is it going to be better and save us right. money? I, I have a question in reference to um, the capacity. Um, and I don't know if you could answer this just generally off the cuff, but how many of our schools are under-enrolled where we actually, I mean, or over-enrolled, I should say, that are at capacity that we need trailers? Do you know that off the end? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we can go back to the visual. I mean, when you're looking at elementary, yeah. the left shows us their capacity with using the trailers. The right. right would be if we got rid of the trailers completely. Significant difference there. Right. Uh, not so much at the middle school, but again at the high school. So our reliance on trailers, um, I think when you look at our last um, facility utilization report, showed that we have a deficiency in elementary and high school with the regards to brick and mortar seats to meet our needs. Yeah. Um, middle school, we don't have that issue. I'm now that's assuming everybody comes in nice neat circles and they go live in the areas close to the schools that we have the capacity to. I think that's the other wild card to this scenario. Yeah, and if we were to remove trailers and put them in the schools, aside from all the logistics of that, do you have any idea how many classrooms we need to add to the schools to do that? Like how much space is, are we talking? So are we like a whole new level? Are we talking about six classes per school? What so I think it depends on how many units, mobile units you have on that campus already, because you'd right. want to replace yeah. those. Um, some campuses have upwards of 30. Trailers? Uh, yep. In a school, yeah. we have several campuses that are. Create. Oh, I think there's at least three campuses I can think of off the top of my head that over twi have over 25 each, mm -hmm. uh, two over 30, um, and so that that's a significant number of seats available. We are using our capital improvement plan to try to build new schools in those particular areas to reduce our reliance on mobile units. Um, in certain areas, though, that's very difficult because of the lack of available land to build the school, to find the school big enough. Um, and again, getting back to the restrictions. I mean, even if we had the funding and we had the time and energy and we had the swing space to move everybody, because if you're gonna move those kids off of, out of the mobile units into the building and do that construction, we gotta have a place for them to go to school in the meantime for the two years that you're doing the construction. And so therefore, we, we just don't have that swing space available as is. But even if we were, again, the, the municipal restrictions are going to limit your ability to add 30 classrooms to a particular site. And I would assume that, and this might be a question more for um, a different department, but um, I would assume that we do explore utilizing other buildings instead of building new schools, right? I, I would I would let you respond to that, but I would say the answer is yes because I know several buildings that were something else and now they're schools. Um, I think Laurel Park was some kind of in uh, Park. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, River uh, Oaks. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we've got several few schools. The ninth grade center. Yeah. So we have quite a few. Northway College and Career Academy is the old Winn Dixie. Vernon Malone. Uh Vernon Malone is another one as well. Cold plant. So the last two here, partial renovation and uh, major renovation, the very similar. Again, lack of swing space like I had just shared, the feasibility of the site that we talked about, competition with the capital improvement plan. For the partial renovation, it's different dollars. It, it would be print dollars. And so you've seen print and snap projects come up. So any of those print and snap projects that we've discussed with you, they would be in direct competition with some of these uh, trailer moves. And then the cost compared to utilizing trailers. I mean, they are a very cost-effective solution for us as a district to solve our crowding needs. And again, I'll share it once more. We do not control the growth that comes to us. We have to be reactionary. And so if we were able to have some, you know, put a pause on building so that we can get the infrastructure in place, that would be ideal. And we continue to try to work with our municipal partners for that. But until then, we're going to have to continue to utilize these cost-effective methods to deal with the growth, the rapid growth. And again, funding. All right. So considerations for not using flexible capacity. Um, we would need to build new schools, right? And so there comes a significant cost with that. Um, there would also be a greater number of families impacted by school reassignment. 
So if we decided you know, tomorrow, hey, we're not gonna use mobile classrooms anymore, we need to try to fit this into the buildings, we'd have to make some adjustments, but if you're talking about a reassignment at any point, you're looking at tens of thousands of students being reassigned as part of this. So that is not something that we've considered doing um, due to the, the, the disruption to families, um, the impact it would have on families. I think what we've got going right now, uh, we've got several um, planned jobs that we've worked on and things that we're working on coming up in the next several years. This is just a snapshot. So from 2022 to 2027, we've been able to remove an equivalent of 110 classrooms off of campuses as part of major renovations or annual removing trailers. Uh, we've been able to remove 55 single classroom trailers, 14 multi-classrooms, those would be anywhere between four and eight classroom units. And then one other use, it was actually a restroom trailer, okay? So we've been able to work towards getting trailers off of our campuses, as well as trying to add that um, capacity back when, when we're able to. And so we'll continue to do that moving forward. Um, I think as we prioritize removing trailers during planned renovations at schools, we're able to you know, help you know, meet the goal of you know, trying to get our trailers down. And we'll, we'll share with you a 25 year goal here for reducing our need by 50%. Um, but we'll also continue to work with our long range planning forecast, student assignment, the annual enrollment plan, our CIP executive summary to determine which schools may no longer need trailers so that we can either remove them from the campus completely and or build that capacity into the building. And we've done a, a good job of prioritizing our least or older units as best as possible. The issue we're concerned with just going to a campus and grabbing the oldest units off of there is the placement of the unit. So if you've got four or five units in front of you, in front of that unit, you can't access it and just pull it off. So you have to move units in order to get it. So it's better to kind of wait until that time where you can remove them all together or um, refurbish them, you know, to get them up to par. We can certainly start to prioritize that. Go ahead, wait. Um, Dr. Yang. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just wondering, what is the feasibility of you know, if, if we were to like remove trailer, if we have the, the, the funds to do so, what is the feasibility of, of switching a school that is a single track year round in order to back to a multi, multi track year round to, in order to, to uh, Use have more capacity? Space, mm -hmm. kind of, right? Okay, so just so I can understand what you're asking. So if we were able to remove four trailers off of the school campus, mm -hmm. Right, bring it down to a brick and mortar, but then change the school calendar to increase the capacity back. Okay. There's certainly, that we can certainly do that. I would just question the impact it would have on families. Because as you change a school calendar, while the students get to go to the same school, you are changing their calendar. That is impactful to families because traditional calendar families have traditionally had the summer off. Other families are generally equipped to deal with daycare at multiple points throughout the year. Um, we often see families of lower socioeconomic status struggle with multi-track year-round calendars, finding affordable childcare. Um, so those would be concerns we would want to try to help address as we looked at a project like that. Um, but certainly there's nothing that would stop us from just up and changing the school's calendar. Um, just one, since you mentioned the problem with removing trailers, um, my hope from one of my hopes from this is that in the future if we need to put trailers somewhere we can do it in a way that if we have to pull one off we can pull it off um, I know it goes back a long way so it's not you know we can't go back and fix that but kind of has have a process going forward to make each trailer accessible because there could we don't want trailers sitting out there if there's a legitimate reason to have to get rid of it and then if we just are you know, getting dinged by the cost of having to move multiple just to get one, I think that's, if it's feasible. So, and I appreciate you asking that because it's a question I've always had and, and never really followed through, but if we have some trailers that we purchase and we build and we site, but other trailers we lease, who's responsible for removing the leased trailer? So that's part of the agreement we so have. Yeah, part of the agreement, the leasing company comes and removes them. 
Um, our portion of that work, though, is to, to demo the decks, the ramps, disconnect the infrastructure, make it ready to be moved. They'll come in, disassemble it, haul it off, and then we come back, pull all the foundations, and then the rest of the work out, the rest of the materials out of the ground, and then refit the area, fit the area. So there's a significant cost, but versus the cost of a trailer we own, or then we also have the disposal of the so actual if trailer. If it's a trailer that we own, so we're going to move it from, from site A to site B. You still have all of those same costs because you're going to improve the donor site, if you will. Um, but now you're going to add the transportation cost of moving the trailer from one point to another. It's about $15,000 okay. to move one of these things from one place to another. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. But since we, since uh, Chair Haggerty mentions the lease units, do we, how many of our total units are being used, whether owned or leased? And I'm get, what I'm going to get to is it, if we have empty ones that we own as part of this that are not going to be used again, is it financially beneficial to get rid of leased ones and move those? I know, you know, the, I don't know if it would be a similar cost. I don't know what we're paying to lease them. On slide nine, it says adding or removing a trailer is $1.8 million. That's each That's trailer. That's for six classrooms. That's, That's for That's six, six trailers. Is that six separate trailers or one of the big ones? Six separate trailers. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I don't know the lease, the cost for the lease one, the ones we lease as, like. So when, when we lease them, we typically don't move a lease trailer from site to site. Right. What is yep. the cost to lease one, a single trailer? Uh, we spend about $1.3 million a year on leases for all of the trailers that we lease. I don't it's about $2,500 a year for a single classroom. Okay. The multi-classrooms vary depending on their age from $20,000 to $80,000 a year and how, and how large they are. Okay. I got you. I don't have for memory, so. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Evans. So the campuses um, that have the most, the 20 trailers and up, are they all eligible to be that land that the trailers are sitting on is that buildable when the time comes for a major renovation or do no, any of those not necessarily a lot a lot of the the, the schools that glenn is referring to say uh, green Hope, for instance they have multi-classroom trailers sitting there so there's eight classrooms in there we call it eight trailers or eight classrooms right uh -huh. it's a single building um, but it's sitting on a basketball court or it's sitting in a parking lot. So that's not a area where you're going to add on to the building. Okay. Or a multi-purpose building. So we're right. basically giving them, giving them back their program spaces that we've taken. Some are on the bus loop okay. at one of the schools. Wow. That's, wow. Cool. that's one. We need another road trip. <laughs> like, yes, our bus trip. Yeah. <laughs> I was not on the board, but I knew about it. And I, I loved thought, our bus trip. I thought it was a great idea. We need to do that. Oh, uh, facilities. All of us get on a bus and uh, go tour some of these campuses. With, with county commissioners, that is. Yep. And the works to, yep. for hopefully this summer. Do a little bit. Yes. Uh, Ms. Coffin, yeah. How many trailers do we have in total? Uh, the exact number <laughs> is 687. <laughs> Yeah. A lot for the 2023-24 um, school year, we used 952 trailers, and the reason why I know that is because we just had a media request for that very information. That includes both the capacity and non-capacity okay. units. And keep in mind, long-range planning counts the trailers a little bit different from Mr. Bevan's group because we're looking at individual teaching spaces and he's looking at the number of units. So if he's saying one eight classroom unit, that may count as one for him, but it counts as eight for me and for Ms. Um, Boyd. Sure. Are all those, is that number the total being used or the number that we have? Because I know we don't use all of them. It's a combination. Um, okay. We did pull a report showing um, what each unit is being used for because we gather that information from the schools annually. So we do have a few campuses where some of the units are vacant. Um, as I had shared uh, with the board previously in a few presentations is that once COVID hit, a lot of uh, the mothball or retirement
hire trailers, that term kind of went away as we had to kind of spread out and move yeah. people and um, uh, set up different programs. But we do track which units are being used and what they're being used for. What is the lifespan of a trailer? <laughs> mm, forever. To say forever. He's taking care of them. So. It's like a good marriage. Keep working on it. Good answer. The average age of a Wake County owned single classroom is 32 years. Mm. Forever for us. That's the average age. There are 295 of them that are over 35 years old. Wow. That's a good marriage. Wow. Yeah, that's just All right, so you had asked us to look at a 25-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so staff, you know, feels like the work that we're doing right now, right, I shared the numbers with you. We were able to move 110 classrooms in the last six years. Yeah. Um, if we continue at that pace, we think we can reduce the number of trailers on our campuses by 50%. Now, again, this is going by the... The, the actual number of units, the 600, you know, over 600 uh, units. So if we continue to do that, you're looking at an average of, what is it, 12 a year? Yeah. Over the next several years. So if we couple that with taking trailers off while we're doing major renovations, um, utili uh, utilizing our forecast, our student assignment plan to be able to remove uh, trailers off of schools that don't need the extra utilization, the capacity on their campus, over the next 25 years, we think we can make a significant dent in uh, the, the capacity of the trailers that we just don't need, or if we can move it into the building. So this raises a couple of questions for me. Um, you know, we see, and I think I'm just expressing this my, as myself, as one board member, I think one of the, the toughest things for me is we only see so far into the future as far as long-term planning goes. So we're constantly asked to kind of make decisions um, without knowing where our building, pro I'm talking specifically about the building program. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Chair Haggerty and I um, talked with transportation. They had a couple of questions and, and it was sort of, uh, I'm gonna use the term where you're kind of piecemeal a couple of spots and I, and, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we were in agreement that we needed a comprehensive long-term plan so the board can actually see what's coming and we can plan for it more effectively and then so we can communicate it to the public because oftentimes the public doesn't know until we have a bond coming. Like, oh. <laughs> well, so you, and so you did the 25-year forecast. Are you anticipating, is that mean there's a good idea of, hey, we're going to have schools here or these schools, and is that something then that we as board members can kind of see what the, what, what does 25 years of, build, of the building program look like so we can be informed? So our capital improvement plan will give you an insight into that, right? But that's seven years, yeah, right? Correct. <coughs> and, and, and I'll add, you need to be flexible on the, the outer years because but nobody has data yeah. changes. So yeah. I think we've got a list of renovations that the facilities design um, and the capital improvement plan team has been working on. And so we're working down to try to prioritize renovation projects as they come up, um, as they need to be brought up on the list. And then when they're brought into the capital improvement plan, we'll then look at any of the trailers on those campuses and see if we can bring the trailers into the building capacity. If not, then we'll need to look at refreshing or refurbishing them because we'll need them for longer term. Mm -hmm. So that's part of our plan. Now, naming the actual schools for you for the next 25 years, I don't right. think that's feasible, yeah. uh, but I can tell you that staff is gonna continue to utilize our capital improvement plan, our renovations that we've got coming up. We've got a list of schools we continue to look at, and then we'll use those four options that we've shared with you to address the trailer concerns. To clarify, when you said you you can't name the schools. What you mean where the trailers are, or do you mean any? Well, we just don't know. I, I mean, the, so the, if I told you today the next 25 schools that we should be going to work on and pull off trailers may not be the same data we have two years right. from now, right? Because the information we get from municipalities, like I've shared with you, changes every year. We meet with them every year. Now, it doesn't change, change drastically every year, but over the course of five yeah. years, you've got. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. 
you look at certain areas of the county, when I first moved here 20 years ago, I never thought we would have crowding concerns at some of those schools, mm -hmm. and yet now we've got significant crowding concerns in some of those areas. Yeah. So that data continues to change because as municipalities continue to grow, we have to be reactionary to that. Yeah, and so Mr. Hershey, what I would say is that think developing, I think, I, I know that developing a 25-year plan is good for the community and, and that means we need to front load that by saying that regardless of what we do in a 25-year plan, we know there is a, what I would call a usable portion of that plan that really doesn't go beyond seven to ten years. Yeah. But, but we could certainly take the information and the data that we have now and say based on the projections that we see, in 25 years, uh, we can expect the population to be this. We can expect this is the number of schools that we might need. And we can say that based on today's dollars, if we were to build X number of schools, it would yeah. cost this much money, mm -hmm. knowing that you make adjustments to that plan within the appropriate amount of time. But I think it would clearly say to people that in today's dollars, looking at the 25 years from now, we as a community would need to invest an additional $6 billion in capital projects. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of puts people in the, in the mind frame of what the future really looks like. And, uh, and so I, I, Glenn is absolutely right. We can't guarantee it, but I think the more we do the, to show the people the possibilities, I mean, if we're the number two growing metropolitan area in the nation, I don't likely see that changing drastically to some degree between now and, and I think as an individual board member, not definitely not speaking for my colleagues here, I think I view that as helpful. So because we are not a taxing authority, yeah. you know, our relationships with the commissioners, our relationships with uh, our constituents, so they have a sense of what we are really talking about long term because we're going to have to make the sale to them when it comes to bonds and um, for them to understand all the projects we're, we have in front of us over the long term. I mean, we haven't even touched on life cycle stuff, um, which is, you know, I brought brought up earlier and, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of that, but we have life cycle projects and, and we just, the more we can, to me, as I communicate with constituents, the more I can tell them and paint a picture of where we are, the more understanding and buy-in I always get. I've never had anybody say, oh, you're telling me too much. This is, you know, I'm going to be against that. And it doesn't mean we have to share every detail. And we have to have, if this is going to be done in 2033 or, you know, I, I just hope I'm on this side of the ground in 2033, right? But <laughs> I'm no. just, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, like, we're not, we're not having to give specifics, but a, a longer plan because we are going to have to build a lot, and so we are going to need this money, and it's going to be a lot, and we got, we have to prepare people for this. For this I appreciate you saying that, you know, not naming them as much because we don't want to pit communities against each other. Correct. Right. And, and you know, I. I often talk about, you know, I've got three children, and I can't always do everything that each child wants. We have to do what's best for the entire family, and that's kind of how we approach our school system. You're always looking at what's best for yeah. the entire school system as a whole, not right. just the individual community. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think, just it, thank you for putting all this together, too, because yeah. I know we've had, we've had this, did an yes, job. Yeah. everyone. I, I know we have this conversation often, we joke about it, and. Um, you know I'm not a fan of the trailers, but <laughs> I, I do, I understand the need for it. I just, in, so for me, getting all this information, I would just hope that our goal would always be to have the flexible space within the school, obviously when we're doing our new buildings, but um, versus, I mean, we see how the cost of each one of these trailers, it's significant, and it's, it's not what it was a couple of years ago either. I think I, when I was doing the math, if I did it right, I think it's five times more the price now for, uh, or even a little bit more than that to do the trailer. Um, and then you still have to maintain it. Um, and it's not the ideal situation. And I think in the, it, the way it was explained to me in the beginning, trailers were a temporary solution for the growth that you were having until you were able to iron it out. 
I don't see in Wake County that changing because of the way we're growing. Even in the most ruralist areas, we're just growing in leaps and bounds. So I don't feel that it's a that it's a, that it's going to change. So um, I just hope that going forward, we are more looking how we can fit the school without the trailer space and more the flex space. I mean, obviously that's going to be much easier and it looks like cheaper in the newer schools, but. So um, the only restrictions I can really think of because we can plan accordingly with the dollars, um, it would just be our site restrictions. So mm -hmm. the municipal restrictions that are placed on that particular site would probably be our biggest barrier. Right. And that seems engagement. more concentrated as you get closer to yeah. the city, right? Mm -hmm. That's what our community engagement team is for. Our committee. Oh, by the way, there's one I'm surprised you haven't said it yet. Is the process for when we get site maps for new buildings. And early on, we had one that had trailers on it. Like, here, we're going to build a school, and here's where the trailers would go. That's where I was kind of going with that. I just okay. didn't want to say you, No, no, you can, I'll say it. You know, that is a frustrating up. aspect for me as a board member. Yeah. That instead of building, trying to build, a little bit bigger and having excess space for future capacity, we were already planning on having, the not trailers. necessarily having trailers there, but here's where they would go. So that was a frustrating aspect for me as an individual board member. But inevitably, that's what I'm talking about with the with the growth that we're having, those will become trailer spaces, and right? If we, unless we build enough capacity within the new build, in theory. Right. <laughs> so, and if we are not uh, not going to build with the trailer intention right there, at least, because um, I think one one example was you know put the road around it. So instead of separating the space for the trailers, yeah. that was the space where you would put the addition on, um, and that just kind of is a little bit more proactive to solving the problem later on down the road and not have to turn to the the trailers or leasing or extra money that is the not so temporary solution. And I, uh, the, 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 the dollar amount is really also easier for us to understand when we're talking about budget and where we need all, to put all our money, you know, understanding this about the trailers and what that costs and the, the, the inner city more challenges that we have with building up or how we can do that. It also helps us prioritize where we need to put our money to. You didn't get, you have one more slide. Oh, now you went, now it's not the question. Any other questions? Um, I mean, one, one additional thing that probably hasn't been covered um, is what, you know, we talk about growth, we talk about, you know, the, and, and this city is growing, but there are pockets of places where the growth has peaked or has, has gone beyond and, and people are grow or, or, or moving farther out or to different places and needs have changed and the school capacity has changed. You know, how, how do you account for or accommodate those changes using, using the flexible capacity? Is, is this the, you know, how, how do you manage that? I, you know, I, I have a hard time seeing it because I'm, I'm seeing it from my own personal you know, area that there are pockets where, you know, they have, you know, the, the, the schools what were once, you know, the very, very, you know, crowded, popular places to go, and then now it's not. So, so that's where we would lean on our forecast, right? We've got a 10-year forecast that tells us we're going to expect to um, have X number of students at these particular grades, right? It doesn't give us the by school forecast, but that that's something that staff can look at and see you know, what trends do we have in a particular area. Um, for example, you know, you've got five years in a row of the kindergarten class coming in at less than what it was the year before. You can start to see that trend that, you know, you're not growing in this particular area, you're aging out. And so therefore, long term, do we need the additional capacity at that particular school? That's where long range planning and student assignment will look at, okay, can we utilize our enrollment plan to help us either bring that capacity, the enrollment down at the school so we don't need the extra capacity, and or do we just look at our capital improvement plan in removing the trailers from the campus? That's something we'll continue to do. That's, and that's the thing that, that, you know, we're always, you know, talking about adding the trailers, but, you know, when, when will we, we remove the trailers in response to the change in, you know, the, the, the population? 
Well, I think we've been a little gun shy, right? I mean, you looked at the fourth, the fourth and fifth grade class size legislation that possibly um, was brought up. That really, you know, had us on our <laughs> on our heels because of the amount of classrooms we would lose if that had happened. Um, so I think, you know, as that's not progressing, we can certainly continue to look at it. I think our our biggest area where we can make the most impact in the next several years is our middle school. I mean, you saw it on the maps, our middle school capacity. We do have a surplus of seats, um, and so therefore we can start to utilize that. Um, two other issues about trailers that we didn't really touch on. Um, one, the weather, because it's my understanding as our policy if there is, or I don't know what the specifics are, but if there is a tornado threat, I believe they all have to go inside and so as I, I don't remember tornado threats when I was at NC State in the 90s and I don't foresee it changing I could be way off it could the numbers could actually say something different and I was just in college not paying attention so um, the individual principals of the schools have a plan in place to deal with these particular situations <laughs> they bring the students into the school building um, they could utilize the, the media center the, right. the gym uh, other classrooms within the building. Not, that's yes, but ultimately, it's. I'm, I'm looking at the. We have the pros and cons, and this is on the cons list. And it's it is moving kids in, and it could become more frequent. Um, the other part piece is not all of them have restrooms, right? Have bathrooms. Correct. So sometimes you've got to leave a trailer to go to a bathroom, and and so I would one as an individual board member is that I hope we do everything in our power to, in our future builds, to try to avoid having trailers because there are a number of items like that that I do think about that are disruptive to, to learning unnecessarily, you know, if we can avoid it. Thank you so much. See, that was fine. <laughs> Appreciate, Appreciate all the hard work that went into this. Um, extremely useful for the community to hear about this and that we are it is on our minds and we are thinking about it. If we had all the money in the world, we would make, a, make some changes faster, but funding is a real issue when a, you have a school district this size. Appreciate you. Thank you. executive summary and I'm just going to tee it up uh, for Jack uh, so to date we have already brought you the, the program assumptions update the standards and guidelines update the cost model update uh, and today we'll be bringing we bring you the executive summary um, and like I said Jack, Jack will uh, take it and please ask questions uh, throughout if you have any. all right so the Purpose and goals of today are talk about the um, update of this year's executive summary. I'm going to go over an overview of the components that make up the summary, discuss some changes from last year, and uh, talk about the next steps. So, the components, the major components of the executive summary include new schools, existing schools, and other program requirements. Is how it's broken up. Let's get into specifics the new school projects is construction of a new school not previously in existence at a new or existing site. And a couple of examples down there of what those projects are recently. Those are pretty straightforward. It gets a little more complicated when you talk about existing school projects. Although the majority of them are full replacements of an existing school on an exi exi existing site, uh, projects could be a combination of either renovation, addition, or replacement. Um, so replacements are an existing school to be torn down and replaced with a new construction on its same site. York and Fuller, recent examples of that. 
Um, renovation, similar, is existing school to be renovated on its existing site. Um, Wiley Elementary is a recent example of that. And then a relocation, is existing school is to be relocated from its existing site to a new site with new construction. Green Green Middle School is an example of, of one of those projects, which we typically don't do that often. Uh, next section is the program requirements. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these uh, specific details for you. These are the, the individual line items on the executive summary that have funding and um, some definitions and specifics of what all those entail. Let's continue on this slide with major other categories of projects still within the program are SNAP and PRIMP. Um, if you notice here and some examples of what those projects are, uh, SNAP Early Learning Center, Wake STEM Early College High School, Piney Plains Transportation Center are examples of recent SNAP projects or ongoing SNAP projects. Um, PRIMP um, projects include Fuqua Verena Elementary School, which is being planned currently, Brassfield Elementary School, which is a, a recent one completed. Um, CTE modifications, outdoor learning centers, things of that nature. And then it wraps up with uh, program management and program contingency. All right, so moving on to the uh, proposed executive summary. Um, important to note that this has been um, reviewed extensively by the CIP team and the joint core team of the county. Um, the pro proposed funding aligns with the county's debt model, and they are good with the um, bottom line numbers. So the new school summary, the changes are, are highlighted or shaded in light blue. Um, so we'll stick with the exceptions, changes from last year. Uh, we added new ES TBD1. That was previously in the um, renovation or existing school category last year and it's moved up. Same dollars, it's just moved up with um, it previously being listed as the um, Wendell relocation project. It's the idea with this is to move it up to a new school, use the new school space once it's done as the swing space for um, Wendell, and then have a new population in this new school once Wendell swings back to their existing one. Um, the only other change in the new school summary is with FY31 coming online, you have design dollars for a new high school to be determined. In the high school, it's a place Holder, that can change from middle school, elementary school, depending on needs as we get closer to that date. Right, moving on to the existing school summary. Again, changes are highlighted in light blue. Um, Athens Drive High School, you'll see that shaded in FY27 when we were able to add that high school to the renovation category back two years ago. Um, it was a new school, a new elementary school. We didn't have the opportunity to change any of the bottom line numbers. We couldn't change the budget for that. So it is programmed, or the budget is based off of a large model of new school. New school construction is uh, a little bit cheaper than renovation construction. So this year, we had the opportunity to slightly increase that unit rate. Um, and so we bumped that up about $10 million to account for a renovation. Question. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You were talking about Athens Drive, right? Correct, yes. Can you, re can you repeat that? I didn't follow what you said. Sure, so the, in 2022 update, two years ago, mm -hmm. we balanced the amount of new schools and renovations. We're bringing down more renovations. And the ability to do that, we couldn't change the bottom line number of the CIP. And so we, in order to have a high school on here, it had to use an elementary school slot for, for budget, for funding. Okay. Thank you. Specifically, like Lynn, we planned maybe another new elementary school right. in, like you remember this, Cary or Morrisville, mm -hmm. but because of the need for another high school renovation, we just changed how we would use the dollars rather than totalize the dollars. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, so we had a small opportunity this year to increase that funding. Um, again, the scope is to be determined. We're just getting into that design. Um, and depending on what that comes out to be if the if the budget doesn't align with the scope we'll look for other opportunities to increase the budget as we go as, a, as much as we can um, the second change you'll note is East Garner Middle School the um, 74 million highlighted in FY 28 same scenario with um, Washington 
Mrs. Washington as well. Same scenario is Athens Drive. We're trying to increase the unit rate from a, a new school to a renovation. And it was also switched from Washington Elementary School to East Garner this year um, based on previous projects and I think walkthrough we did last summer at Washington Elementary School, not necessarily needing the extent of a full mm -hmm. renovation. Um, and with North Garner Middle School, the current project not being able to account for additional capacity at its site, um, East Garner, we're going to build that into that project. Um, with life cycle funds and I think some print funds taking care of some of the other needs at Washington Elementary School. All right, so moving down the list with Wendell Elementary School, this ties into the change in the previous slide with new elementary TBD1. So Wendell Elementary is going to be planned to swing into that new school with the renovation um, and then swing back once it's complete. The only other two changes to existing school summary fall into FY31 with uh, design funds for two new projects. All right, so moving on to the program slide. Um, only change here is a shift in the outer three years, FY29 through 31, with taking $10 million of SNAP funds and shifting it into the print category. It's a net zero change, but based on the recent um, forecast and requests from the projects, there's more needs for print than there are SNAP projects, and so we're shifting this to account for that. And if that changes in the you know, out years, we can always adjust as needed. Um, there's not many changes this year. That wraps up the, the program requirements. Um, this is a summary of all three major categories with a total seven-year plan of uh, $2.8 billion. Um, it's about $82 million increase from last year's plan, mostly accounted for the escalation with FY31 coming online and FY24 going offline. Next steps, um, incorporate any feedback we get today. Um, plan is to take this to the board work session on the 16th um, and request that we take it to the full board that same day at the regular meeting for approval. Any questions? So one of the things that I know we don't often associate with like capital expenditures is we do have like our tech device budget here. And when you look at it, it really is the second largest line item in each of the fiscal years. And I know we've had to move to a one-to-one -one ratio. Upkeep and maintenance on these devices, is replacement of the devices is expensive. Just with a lot of our other needs that we have, that we've seen in life cycle, you know, life cycle needs, has there been any thought to evaluation? Is this something that you all, the core team, had maybe looked at and then come back and said, no, we really want to keep this level of investment in tech? Or I just, I know it's a priority, but I know we have a lot of other competing priorities. So we haven't, with the limitations of the seven-year plan working with the county for, with their debt model, we don't have that many opportunities to increase any of this year to year. Um, which is why you're not seeing, a, you know, like right. Athens Drive go up to account for a full renovation. We just don't have that opportunity. The same, um, I say all that, in, in last year, I believe it was, where Marlowe, previous um, chief technology mm -hmm. officer, gave us a presentation to increase that budget based on, you know, turning over and all the needs with the one-to-one -one devices and with all the COVID money basically going away. There's significant increases that they requested that we just weren't able to even touch um, based on the other priorities and the needs. Mm -hmm. um, so to reduce it at this point, I, I'm not sure what that would take coming from technology uh, to change the way they're doing things or I just, mm -hmm. you just don't know yeah. what they requested two years ago. I recognize it would be a significant policy shift. I just, in terms of priorities and long-term needs, I just don't know if that level of investment is sustainable compared to the investment we need just in the basic, you know, basic school infrastructure. 
So I just bring it up. I didn't know sure. if you had any discussions. And I know you can't raise that. It is a seven-year number, but in terms of shifts within those total numbers, I was just asking. Yeah, we'd love to shift. You know, some of these major <laughs> and use it for other priorities. It's again, yeah. how to do that is, is the tricky part. I appreciate it. Thank you. Apple well, stepped up and, you know, <laughs> paid for all of our tech devices. And, <laughs> Lobby them a little bit more, maybe. So, um, along that that question, um, and I had asked this for the budget question, so I know that that's probably going to come up next week. Um, has there been consideration to moving from the one-on-one -on -one device to a per request and having devices in the classroom? I mean, I know that there are plenty of students that are not using those devices, but. We have to account for money in our budget for maintenance, for <coughs> staff, for the amount of devices we have out there, and then recycling those, because I think it was mentioned once before that there's only like a three to five year lifespan, if I'm not mistaken. So, and you see on there how significant that is in the cost. Sure. So if we were to move that to staff and classroom, instead of having a one-on-one -on -one device, could we have a significant change there? Possibly. I know that's what they were moving away from with the one-to-one -one devices, is getting away from the classroom model. Um, and COVID obviously had reasons to do that, but they were moving that way anyway um, for many reasons that I can't articulate to you today. So the answer to that, to that would be kind of, because the one thing I don't know is where all of the funding for devices has come from, and, and that could be a whole bunch of places. Some comes out of capital needs, some may come out of uh, program funding, federal funding. Normally there's a, a blending of how that's done, uh, but certainly anything that's spent on devices that comes out of a capital fund could be redirected. But the question would be how much would that be, and if it would make a serious dent in terms of helping out uh, building programs. Yeah, because that's a significant amount. And I mean, if we have um, that amount of money and we don't necessarily need all of it, you know, it, it may be a, a big ask, but having a request only, because there are some people that will actually need that. You know, we talk about, you know, there's certain areas that need it more than others, there's certain students that may need it and don't have other devices. I mean, I know for myself, my kids, are probably growing dust <laughs> um, for different reasons, but my my one of my children they take their their to school every day. They take their own, um, so that's like I'm just thinking in relation to the whole county having such a large number there in in that on that chart and seeing it in the budget because when we discussed it out in the budget, that was one of my questions: is could we move to a request only and then have it in the and I mean that could at 160,000 students, it's not going to change for the staff, but it, that's a significant amount of devices. And, and I would say that uh, both technology and academics, are, they will be presenting information at some point to me about what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the major difference is that the pandemic put us in a situation where we needed 160,000 devices, uh, but most districts are not in that position. You normally do. Um, one-to-one -one take home at a high school, sometimes a middle school. Um, and then technology infrastructure will talk about whether or not you allow outside devices to come in because that has an impact as well. But um, you know, uh, the hope is that we don't need 160,000 because of a pandemic situation, but it'll change from one year to the next. You never know what's going to come up. But, but they will be bringing information so we can talk about what the future with uh, devices will look like. Could we get a comparison of what the class seats we have at any given time versus students, like just to understand that difference? Yes, that shouldn't be a problem. And, and normally what a, what a district will have is the ratio of uh, students to devices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's going to be a recommendation that comes from DPI. Uh, and so you got to remember that all of that is really not about one-to-one. -one. That ratio is going to look at all devices that are in, available in a building, whether they're issued to students or not. So there's a certain um, um, range that we want to be in uh, to support academic programs. But, but we, can, we can look at that and see what those comparisons are. Okay. 
And could you explain the difference? You have life cycle buildings and life cycle furniture and equipment. What's Sure, so the uh, life cycle buildings is, is systems replacements, HVAC, roofing, electrical, um, those things of that nature. The life cycle furniture is broken out separately. That's strictly to replace the furniture um, of a, a particular building, so it doesn't get lost in a bigger category. Okay, so it's 40 million in the building and systems like that. Correct. Okay, and then the difference in the technology and technology infrastructure. Yep, so tech devices is computers and, and things of that nature, um, where the infrastructure is the backbone of the network pieces that goes into um, this vast as old group, I say. I'm not sure who's taking that over. When you say backbone, are you, do you mean like the staff that's helping run it? No, I mean I mean the install, the wiring, all of the oh. network um, switches, routers, switches, switches, the routers, routers, routers yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the same thing with the program continuity and then management what's the difference between the two so program C okay, that's contingency uh, is the abbreviation sorry. there so that's three percent of all of the other items which is essentially a management reserve mm -hmm. fund um, to use if bid prices come in you know higher than expected and we don't have another funding source of savings it's to be used for that emergency projects come up um, we use it for that as well um, program management is funds for staff essentially it's all of FDNC's um, labor third party to uh, manage the program. Okay. Thank you. How often are we using the whole land budget and if we don't use it, what happens to it? That's an excellent question I can't answer. Come back, you can yeah. let us know at the work session if you could. Mm -hmm. um, the, and you know, we were having a conversation about the cost of land and, and potentially needing to spend more in order to save on a bill. How, as land prices go up, are those numbers gonna stay at that level? Are we confident that that's enough money on a given year for land? Another excellent question. I think what would be needed for that is, is the specific forecast of, of what land is gonna be purchased each year <coughs> you know, in the seven year plan and how that the funds based on historic prices of, of cost per acre. Yeah. Um, it's increased in the last 10 years. Um, factor that into it. That information is just not provided currently. Um, so, why not? It's of a confidential nature, we're told, that it's not privy to the rest of our group. Yeah, and it's something certainly that can be worked out. If uh, we'll have to see if there's any shortfalls, any, any issues. I don't believe that we've heard you know, that, uh, that that has been problematic. but. Um, Mark may know more sure. about that than I do. Talk yeah. about that. That's fine. I just, I think it's also important though to understand like the value of land banking sites. Yeah, sure. As it becomes more and more difficult for us to acquire land and quality pieces of land, it's imperative for us to use that information to get ahead of some of the building in certain areas so we can acquire that land. So even if we don't use it at that particular time, we still have it because it's easier to get it now than it would be later after the growth comes. Well, and that's why. Even if we have to spend more, I was kind of not thinking of spending less. But if we have to spend more and to do something like that, yeah, and, and spending more, you know, could be an overall savings to the district. Right. You know, where the, the site development costs are less, um, and and it could be a big saving. So, uh, to your point, it's a very good point. Is that flexibility as you work with our partners? Is that have we talked about that as a I mean, they, they are well, well aware of the value or the, the uh, cost of land. Um, so, and currently, I mean, we're uh, receiving the land and then developing the land. Right. Um, and so we, uh, we hope uh, that, uh, you know, we'll, as you, I think you all know, I mean, we're getting a little bit more involved, you know, in, in some of the reviews and right. things like that. So um, I think we're going in that direction. But I mean, this, I'm talking about you're getting the money from the county, and this is part, right? For, so, uh, we having conversations about that possibility in the future that we might have to spend more on land than we have on there. I mean, certainly we have to recognize the market, <clears throat> yeah. and as land becomes more scarce and as land becomes more expensive, if those numbers 
aren't, aren't getting where we need to be, then we certainly will have to make the adjustment. And just know those bottom lines, you know, those bottom totals are uh, pretty pretty rigid. Yeah. So something else gives. <clears throat> sure. Any other questions? No, I know we're on, as we got a schedule, so uh, I'll save anything else for later. Uh, we, we took a 30 minute presentation off, we're way ahead. And yep. so it's 4.20 now, be careful, be done by five. I have a question um, in re reference to the, um, the CIP approval. They're coming to us, is it the next meeting? It's going to be right. April 16th. Yeah. April 6th? Actually, next week. Next, yeah, week from the day. Next Tuesday. And Dr. Taylor, when you were saying that they were going to come to us with a presentation about the technology? No, we haven't set a date for that, but I know that they're looking at um, Shashi putting together his um, technology plan and what that's going to look like and so I know he's going to have to cross-reference that with uh, what academics would expect in terms of devices and what we want um, what's going to be required of students and so once we kind of get all of that information together then we can bring that back to the board they haven't said any uh, formal data bringing something back to the board but I know that's part of what we're doing is that going to be part of this budget cycle uh, probably not not this budget cycle because I, uh, I don't know at what point we're looking at uh, the replacement cycle. I'm not sure what that is, um, but I would assume um, those devices would be being cycled out after next school year. Uh, so if we think about the pandemic, they're going to have anywhere from a three to five year life cycle. Uh, and, 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 yeah, and, and, and I know that most districts have it done in phases. You, you, know, you just can't replace all devices in a district at one time. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe some districts can do that, but um, you know, the idea is you do it in phases, middle, uh, elementary, high, high, but just whatever that rotation may be. So I'll, I'll make sure I can have them to do some kind of update to let you know kind of where we are in terms of, in terms of technology and, and replacement cycles and things of that nature before they bring something forward. Okay. And can you just I, I, last year, it was just kind of like a little bit of a whirlwind in certain areas. So, um, with the CIP approval, this comes from county money, right? Yes. Correct. It's 80% uh, funded by debt and 20% funded by cash. So, by us approving the this plan, it's what we're asking the county for. Essentially, we ask them to fund this the total CIP. Um, all they, all the county does is, is agree to do it for one year in, in advance. Um, although they're statutory required to fund the whole thing, uh, but technically, as in terms of what the resolution asks for, since here's our, our seven-year plan, we ask for funding for it, um, and they, they agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hi, my name is Shane Webster, Senior Facility Planner at FDNC, and uh, we're here today with, with Alice Reese, our Senior Site Planner, and of course Elizabeth Sharp, the Director of Planning, and of course you all know Dave. Uh, we're here to present Lockhart Elementary School. Um, it's an addition renovation project uh, in Eastern Wake County. Um, and we're going to start by letting Alice walk us through the site get you familiar with that and then I'll take over and give you some more specifics about the buildings. Hello. Uh, so you see in front of you the site for the existing Lockhart Elementary School. Um, it is located on Smithfield Road in Nightdale, about two-thirds of a mile south of Nightdale High School and uh, Forestville Road Elementary School. You can see from the image there are multiple buildings and modular units on site. <laughs> building number one, we've affectionately termed the zigzag building, and this building will remain um, through construction and after construction. Building number six is the gym building, and that will remain during construction. Buildings number two, three, four, five, and collectively number seven will be demolished. Yeah. <laughs> the two driveways on Smithfield Road will remain. You see point A and B, they're circled in the green. And also, um, students will remain on campus during the renovation. It's a small population. We've worked with the principal and found a way to um, con concentrate them into the existing space we have and zigzag, and we're going to transform the gym to add a media center component. Shane can talk more about logistics of that. Um, but keeping kids on campus does require a phased approach, so we're gonna look at that next. Phase number one on the left, um, the students, like I said, they will be occupying the zigzag classroom building, and the gym will be modified for PE and media center use. We're going to bring a kitchen mobile unit from Fox Road Elementary to this school site and locate it, it's the green rectangle at the end of the zigzag. Um, all buildings outlined in red will be demolished and the new building addition will um, go on top of those in that space. It's shown there on the right as sort of the lighter yellow color. And so in phase two, once that is complete, the students will move from zigzag into new building. Um, the kitchen mobile will go away. The gym building will go away. Site improvements will take place, meaning carpool, bus, parking, adjustments to play, and um, the zigzag building will get renovated. So a nice fresh um, and some of the classrooms modified. The duration on phase one will be approximately 17 months. Just real quick, oh, was yeah. the school built? Uh, well, the school was built in multiple phases throughout the years. The earliest, probably about 1949, that would be the gymnasium. And the latest one was the zigzag building, I think, is 1998. Thank you. So phase one duration, approximately 17 months. Phase two duration, approximately 13 months. And the dates here that you see on the screen are um, accurate. I think in Precis there was a, um, a, a different date, but these are the ones that are accurate. For now. We're For now. We're still in the very early <laughs> stages, so things are always moving a little bit. Yeah. All right, the next slide, um, just for curiosity's sake, you can see how the new building fits on top of the existing site. And also wanted to take this opportunity to explain that the safety and security of the students and how they go throughout the campus during the renovation is kind of paramount to our planning and has always been a consideration. Based on that, you can see we've kind of identified the yellow dash line as the construction limits and then working with the architect shape the new building within those limits. Um, so that's, we have a lot of details to work through <laughs> on getting, you know, sidewalks and um, you know, infrastructure, utility, how to disconnect old utilities, hook up new, but we'll get through those details with the contractor. And the next slide will show you the proposed 
site. Yep, there it is. Um, see old zigzag there on the bottom, still there, fresh and new. And just south of the zigzag building is going to be the new parent carpool loop. So this loop is designed to house or for a capacity of 700 students. Um, or 716 actually. 800 core, yep. So we already are thinking about planning for that future capacity. Future, yes. What, what are they uh, zoned for now? What's their capacity now? The capacity. The current capacity, student capacity today is about 450, uh, but they have more capacity than that. That's just what their student population is. So this, this reconstruction is actually significantly allowing more children yeah. in the school, right? Ultimately, yes. So you say that the enrollment is now 450, but yes, the sir. actual capacity is what? Of the new school is 716 with the core paper. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. The current capacity in the brick and mortar is 410 with 12 trailers is 650. Okay. The enrollment is lower than that, and I think we may have been mixing up those two. Yes. Thank you very much. That's great. All right. So, uh, getting back to the site, <laughs> um, bus will enter at driveway B on the north side. They'll be dropping off the students near the media center. And behind the media center, we have the cafe and dining area. This is going to give us a great opportunity for outdoor dining. I'm very excited about that, as you know. Um, in the back, then you have the service court, the loading dock. Item number seven is the PE, the gym, and we have a great connection right to an outdoor space, a nice flat space where they can do PE outside. Um, building number two is a new classroom wing. Three is identifying the main entrance of the building, and that is where carpool will drop off. So carpool, yeah, you want to run through carpool, Elizabeth, they go down the loop, they turn around, they come on back, they cross around front, and then they drop off there. The, the exit out of um, driveway B as well. We have the pre-K and our special education areas inside a cute little nook of the building, so they'll be um, nice and safe in there, yes. Yeah. Carpool and the bus loop are gonna leave the same? Correct. Is that, uh, it's not um, optimum, but we've, we've done it before. Um, on campus, we can e more easily hold up parents so buses can leave, yeah. or vice versa, hold up buses and let parents go. Okay. Um, you, you know, these days, we have an awful lot more carpool riders than buses, yeah. sadly. Yeah. They do that at Swift Creek. Okay. They share them. I have to say our principal at uh, Heritage Elementary and Middle School, at the middle school, he was out there and he was, yeah. I mean, the traffic was moving faster than yes. you could drive down Rogers Road. <laughs> right, yep, yep. Yeah. And so, um, I haven't talked about my favorite part yet, K2 play and 3-5 play. You see those by the, that, those aren't swimming pools, but that is our, <laughs> our play areas. Um, and then the red dashed extension on the end of the classroom wing building that would be where flexible capacity would go. So no mobiles on this site, but it would be built into the school site. <laughs> and um, I think that's it. I mean, overall, the site, there's not a lot of drastic changes to the site, but Shane can talk to you about changes in the building. Thank you, Alice. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see on the screen now is the full build out at the end of phase two, as Alice mentioned, there's two phases, phase one and phase two. Um, you know, uh, it's, building design is based on a large elementary school uh, space standard, which is basically about 123,000 square feet, 716 capacity with 800 core. Uh, after evaluating multiple options on how to execute this uh, addition and renovation on this site, uh, the decision was to remove all the buildings except for building one, uh, which is the zigzag building, which has, as Alice mentioned, has enough capacity so we can consolidate everybody in building one while phase uh -huh. one is being constructed. 
all the other buildings go away, which allows us to build the one large addition in the center of the campus. Uh, making that decision was, was, a, uh, is a, was a powerful one for this project because it allowed us to have one large addition instead of multiple phased addition and it eliminated multiple campus buildings. It reduced the number of required construction phases. Uh, we started out with seven, now we're down to two, uh, which significantly reduces construction costs. And by reducing the uh, construction period, also makes the campus safer uh, for the kids and staff. And uh, you know, we decided to uh, retain the gymnasium building and use it as a temporary uh, media center, so we'll divide a wall right down the middle of it, use half for PE, use the other half for a media center, because it's about the right size for a media center, at least temporarily, it'll work well. Um, our site is so tight that we're, we're not only swinging kids into building one, we're also needing to preserve playground space outside. So, you know, being able to do all this and still preserve space, uh, using the gymnasium allowed us not to have to bring in mobile units for those other uses. So that was a big savings for us. So at the end of phase one, uh, once the new addition is built, uh, you know, the gymnasium building will be torn down because the new building will have a new security vestibule right, right at the front door, a uh, new administrative and student support services suite, new media center, new dining area, multi-purpose, and most of the pre-K and uh, all the pre-K and kindergarten classrooms will be located on this floor as well. Now at the end of phase one, when the building is, com the addition is complete, everybody will move back out of the zigzag building into to the new addition and we'll begin renovations of that build zigzag building. Uh, second floor. Next slide. Yeah, so on the second floor, we basically have grades, uh, you know, four and five, uh, along with learning common space up there that helps to support those uh, academic uh, activities. Um, we will be renovating, uh, while we're renovating the, the zigzag building, we'll also be re-roofing that building as well. Okay, um, then at the uh, end of phase two, which is, you know, the renovation of the zigzag building, we'll move grades uh, one, two, and three back into the zigzag building and take advantage of those larger spaces because those, the classrooms in that building are a little bit larger than what we're programming for the new addition. Okay, next. All right, these are some early uh, studies that the architect has put together for us uh, with this uh, project. Um, again, we're very early. There's a lot of development that's got to, a lot of work that's got to have, going to have to happen on these. Uh, I will point you towards the top image where the flagpole is, and that's where the new front <coughs> door to the campus will be. And obviously it needs to be a little more uh, visible, pronounced, and so we'll continue to develop that. Uh, and we're, you know, we're in the early stages, so you know, we're still looking at and talking about materials and things, but this building will be predominantly brick uh, masonry construction with a little storefront framing. Uh, and entrances, and then um, we might have a few other materials mixed in there, but we just haven't got that level of discussion yet at this point. Okay, next slide. And here are some uh, 3D massing images, which uh, help us understand how the new buildings relate to the existing buildings. So you see the, on the image on the right there, is, that's the old zigzag building in the darker gray and the new two-story building wing that's added to the left there. Uh, and that's looking uh, south, or actually looking northeast uh, onto the campus. And then uh, the image on the upper left is looking north. So again, the zigzag building to the bottom of the image and the new addition above that. And the other image is another image looking to the, to the east. Just got to help help us understand you know, how the buildings work together and how they interfaces with the site amenities that are proposed as well. Um, I think, uh, oh, I just wanted to mention, uh, we did a high level uh, estimate on the project at this point. Uh, the building is about uh, a little over $7 million over budget at this point. Uh, the site is uh, 8.9 million under, but the total budget is about 1.23 million. We will continue to work on that uh, to get it back in budget 
Uh, we're doing another estimate. This was a high level unit cost estimate, so it's very broad scope. We're doing a more detailed estimate. We're working on it now, so whenever we get that information, we'd be happy to bring that information back to the board. Um, when, when we do these projects, and as we're sharing with the county what we're doing, and I know the county has goals as it relates to renewable energy and reducing their, their carbon footprint. Are we having conversations about potentially them providing money that would not, from a different pot for something like solar on these buildings, if we're building solar ready? And so it doesn't take away from our budget, but it helps them with their their goals. We certainly are having discussions with the county, and they certainly are aware, uh, as the county is, as they're updating their uh, their standards and, and, and things like that. So they recognize that we have tremendous needs, and um, sustainability is an additional need. Right. Um, they recognize that. Um, we are trying to make these buildings, these are solar ready. Uh, we do have a, another building that's, uh, that's in the design phase that you know, we do um, anticipate. Hopefully, we're going to be bidding that as a bid alternate, some right, solar, uh, components and some sustainable you know, it, um, uh, features yep. on it. Uh, so we're, we're getting there, um, but uh, we don't have, there is no other account out there that we can tap into to you know, pay for these additional items to answer. Till so they create questions. one for us. I'm sorry? Till they create one for us if we ask. Yeah, okay, got it. That's what I was kind of getting at. Dr. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just looking at the space for the dining, uh, is that uh, taking into consideration um, all the kids dining in the uh, in the space, you know, and, and like rotation, whatever. Right. Um, Typically with elementary school, they're going to rotate. We, we plan all of ours on a three seating mm -hmm. is how we plan our dining. But with elementary, they typically will be rotating the entire time throughout. So they'll yeah, come no, up. I, yeah, because, I, you know, I, I think in one particular school that I know mm -hmm. that, um, um, they, out of necessity, they some of the kids actually take their lunch back into their classroom to eat, uh -huh. um, and they're because they just didn't have that space. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, if it's necessary, you know, could that space be um, converted to to using that space for other things like or another classroom or whatever? So Multi-purpose or? I, I mean, I, you know, because I mean. This particular school, I, I went to tour, and they had to do it because it, they just didn't have that space. Mm -hmm. But is, is there some rule regulation that, that for, for the kids that have to be in the dining area for eating, or can it, can they, can I it be? Um, I can try to help a little bit with that, and if you have know, anything else to add to it. Uh, certainly, um, the preferences for the kids to eat in the dining room. Uh, from a custodial standpoint, that's a big part. Uh, when, especially at elementary school, when they're taking their lunches back to their classrooms, um, the classrooms can get really messy. Um, and they are likely going to stay that way until the end of the day. You know, or the teacher is going to have to be cleaning it up for the students. So that is an issue that you, know, you may not think about. But I know in my past where we had that and, and with COVID and things like that where we were doing different things, and that was one of the things we tried, um, and and it's largely unsuccessful uh, because of you know that one issue. Uh, but uh, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, you know, the dining rooms for new schools, um, and really for as long as I can remember, has been one third of the capacity uh, of the school, um, and that works. Uh, it works, in, but it will break down. You know, if you continue to add mobiles and add mobiles and add mobiles, and you're increasing. The population of that school. Um, the core facilities don't get larger, um, and that's where again, it's break, it breaks down. So that's a, a challenge that we have for schools that are overcrowded. And, and I, I just wonder whether you can build in some some potential future future proof planning for that space where you know if you have to increase classrooms to to build it into it such that you know you have that space if you ever need it, you know. 
some flexibility. In that yeah, design. instead of having to add another trailer um, to to consider using that space <coughs> for another classroom, and, but then having you know the kids eat in the you know bring the, um, the food well, back. I see what you're saying. That use the cafeteria, the dining as classroom space. Correct. And the kids eat inside. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just just an idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to say that you have to do it now, but to say have, having some flexibility in the future. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we sort of address that with the what we call flexible flexible capacity uh, in the site plan. We dotted in an area where four classrooms could be added, but also on the site plan, Alice mentioned that you know we also plan for an outdoor dining area, mm -hmm. which ultimately could be captured as additional space in the future if we wanted to. I, I, you know, we just had a d discussion about trailers, and like, mm -hmm. could we not have a, a tra trailers added in mm -hmm. if we can modify the, the interior space to mm -hmm. to accommodate more classrooms? Mm -hmm. Yes, we will look at every option. So I know I'm going to get questions from parents about this, and I know you have an answer. <laughs> um, but so, can you tell us about the safety precautions that you're going to have when you put like an active construction site mm -hmm. right next to an elementary school? Whatever, tell us a little bit about the measures you're going to put in place to ensure the kids are safe. All right. First and foremost, it's you know the separation. We want to create as much separation as we possibly can, and so by doing that, first thing has got to be the construction fence. Define the construction area. Define where you know uh, materials come in and out, mm -hmm. and we have to manage how you know all the comings and goings happen on that campus. And mm -hmm. it might require that the contractor post uh, a traffic person out there to you know regulate you know mm -hmm. during those times when buses are coming, parents are coming, trucks are coming, all that kind of stuff. And I think we did that pretty successfully at Stow mm -hmm. because we had a real tight site there as well. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing is, you know, we have to get from the zigzag building over to the gym, mm -hmm. you know, to use it for the media and PE. So we want to make sure we, we construct. We'll work with the CMAR to construct a uh, a covered path, if you will, to get us safely over there and back again, so that uh, you know the kids are protected from the weather. Uh, we're protected from any potential materials falling off the building. Uh, it's not under the building, so we're outside the construction zone, but you know, things have a tendency to float in the wind sometimes, and so you know, we want to make it as safe as possible. But the, the other thing is, uh, you know, we'll work with the principal, and we'll work with the CMAR to you know, define how the site needs to be used so it's going to be as safe as possible for the students and the staff. And then uh, we try to do, this, do these two phases as quickly as possible so we can get out of everybody's way and get life back to normal as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think you were trying. Lincoln Heights is where we did um, the last renovation, where it was a very tight site and we built yep. on site yep. while the kids were there. So I think at that point, Skanska may have had even like covered walkways going back and forth. They so they're going to pick different areas because we had students walking through construction zone. I mean, it was it was tight. We and there was not a cafeteria while we were building yep. that site for a short time as well. Mm -hmm. Back to your point. <laughs> and over communication is what's going to be important. So we plan to meet at the school, meet with the parents, make everybody mm -hmm. feel comfortable with what we are doing. Yes. I just want to give parents a visual because like when you say the kids are walking through a yeah. construction site, you just picture That's right. you know, bad things happen. That's so. right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, our goal will be over communicating and letting the parents know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. On that note, we did hold a community meeting a couple of nights ago mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to give everybody an opportunity to see what was going on in the project mm -hmm. and to, to gather their input and comments. Great. And we thank plan you. to have many more. PTA meetings will be there. Um, you mentioned 1.23 million. That is to do this whole project? No, uh, the current high level estimate that we have from the architect puts the total project at about 1.2 million over our budget. Oh, my yeah. So we're working to get that down. Uh, that's, that's not been unusual since COVID. And so uh, things are getting better. I think the last couple of projects I we did so. actually came in under budget or close to budget. Whoa. Mm -hmm. 
months. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> that keeps yeah. yeah, it's through the asterisk there. Yeah. So it's <laughs> under the anticipated. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the clarification. <laughs> I saw the hand motion. Yeah. So it's getting better. We're just not back to what we would call normal being accustomed to pre-COVID. Well, it's possible we are. It's mm -hmm. just, and a lot of the third party estimates and databases that they use, the CNs or independent ones from the architects they use to estimate our projects are still projecting the peak of uh, volatility. Whereas our bid prices that we came in in this organization are right where our budgets are at. So there's a, we use that information to kind of temper where we think it is based on what we see with all of the information. <coughs> Since we are so big, we do have so many projects compared to small organizations that have to specifically rely on a third party. Thank you. So just because we were talking about like the trailers and the costs and all that other stuff, what is the total project for this? I, I feel like it was in the last presentation, but. Total project budget? Yeah. It's about $80 million. Yeah, it's about $80 million. $80 million? Thank you. Thank you very much. We got eight minutes to do Fuqua, what's on my list? Yep, Fuqua, Verena, yeah, elementary. Yes, so we are very excited about this project. We are going to the Fuqua Elementary School. We are going to, um, in order to be able to do the project, we are going to need to swing these students out of this school. So we have the opportunity to swing the Fuqua, Verena students from Pequa Brain Elementary into Hilltop Nemore, January of 2025. They will remain at Hilltop Nemore until June of 2026. That will allow us to, while they are out of the school, do a major renovation on 75,000 square feet of their current building, as well as build them a 21,000 square foot addition, where we will take the 17 mobiles, <laughs> that are sitting on that site and put them in the brick and mortar building. We will also build them in some collaborative space at that same time. We're also going to take the opportunity to build them a true spec ed suite and build them a true pre-k suite. Right now they have worked with yes. what they had for a very long time. Um, we are going to give them a few more group toilets we are adding to their cafeteria space to give them more cafeteria space. Um, and at the same time, we will be building them their security vestibules. We're putting them all under one roof, one point of entry. We will also be doing a sprinkler system for them, fire compression. As I said, can I do fire, fire compression? John's like, just say sprinkler system. We're going to be doing a sprinkler system for them while they're out. Um, and then a number of life cycle items. And also just a refresh. I don't know if anybody's had the opportunity to go to Brassville, um, but if you hadn't, go. Um, we did that over at their school probably about three years ago. So we're just finishing up, I think, the security portion of that project now. So we're very excited about this. We're very excited that we're able to bring those 17 mobiles into the building and that will help with our goal. I think we met our goal for this year, Glenn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> for this year. So a, and a new carpool. Carpool, yes. Yes, we're new carpool. carpool. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. The other important takeaway you know, on this item is that Hilltop Needmore um, will open for business as its own school summer of 2026. Needed, needed to put that out there. That's a, that's a very important note for, for the district. It was anticipated before then, right? It was. Who's the back year? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And I want to clarify that, that we are pushing that back a year. And we are uh, well, still um, working on final details with the town of Fuqua Verena as far as final approvals that are needed to have the Fuqua Verena Elementary School students. Um, you know, occupy the uh, Hilltop Meadmore uh, Elementary School in the time frame that we're wanting. Okay. Sounds good. You got two minutes to do the three months. Uh, that'll work. That's, 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 that's easy. Uh, so we have um, April 16th, we'll have the seven year CIP uh, along with the resolution for funding as Jack had presented earlier. Um, in the month of May, we have quite a lot of life cycle items coming up, which is all good, uh, good for the district. <coughs> and uh, 
Um, we do have uh, county commissioner items in here for um, um, May, um, several of their meetings specific to the budget, the budget work sessions, those items were provided by the county um, and we included it in here and happy to answer any other questions. Anyone get any questions? This falls under new business too, which we have 30 seconds for. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this meeting is adjourned. Good job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all very much.